You may have heard me tell the story of the Scottish Samurai from a Scottish point of view, but today I'm going to give you some details of his life that I haven't done before, and we're going to do it in Nagasaki. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. A while back, I took you to Fraserburgh, Collison and Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland to tell you the tale of a man who became known as the Scottish Samurai. Now, a lot of people at the time in Scotland commented that they'd never heard of this guy. But here in Japan, his Nagasaki home is a visitor attraction. Now today, I'm going to take you there on a bullet train and I also hope to take you to an island that's part of his story as well as being a James Bond film theme location. This is going to be an adventure. Come with. The guy that we're talking about was called Thomas Blake Glover. Now, I'm not going to go into this whole story here. We made that video, remember, but this is just part of his story. Show me a merchant adventurer and I'll show you a businessman that's cut a few corners in his time. Thomas Blake Glover, no different. I want to focus on one aspect of his story that, like him, is central to Japan's story. Now, little symbolises Japanese modernity more than a bullet train. But when Glover arrived in Japan, things were different. He was the first to introduce ships powered by steam engines. Scottish, you know. They needed coal to fuel them though, and central to Japan's industrialisation was one coal mine in particular. But let me give you a bit of background. Japan had been a closed country for over 200 years. When Jesuits came a converting in the early 17th century, Japanese shogunate powers decided to clamp down, shut down and close off to the outside world. With some nasty, head choppy stuff along the way. Nobody was allowed out, nobody was allowed in, apart from a single port for trading, largely with Portuguese in Nagasaki. 200 years of stagnating arms development, an American gunboat and a determined captain later, and Japan decided to open up, with limitations. Five ports were identified where Westerners could come and live and trade. Now, needless to say, not all Japanese agreed. There were attacks on Westerners. There was civil war within Japan as different people vied to enforce their power or ideas. It was the Wild East. But eventually, Shogun power was replaced by the restored Meiji Emperor. There was an uneasy symbiosis between those Japanese who decided to modernise and wanted Western know-how, but without their ownership and Westerners who wanted to make the most of trade and exploit the commercial opportunities from a modernising Japan. It seems that there was a particular reluctance to allow foreigners sale of, access to or partnership in mineral resources like coal. But there was also a Scotsman. 30-year-old Thomas Glover had been in Japan for almost 10 years. He'd come with Jarden Matheson traders and he did a bit of work for them and some for himself on the side. As well as getting by with setting up a tea factory and other things, Glover had made a stack of cash by selling steamships and arms to at least one side in the Civil War. But the modernised Magi, they were his favourites. He did this from his house overlooking Nagasaki Bay. It was the first western house built in Japan. Now Glover's house in Aberdeen is pretty much forgotten, but his house in Nagasaki attracts two million visitors a year. From that house, he'd intrigued with modernizers and southern clans against the shogunate. But as the Meiji regime gained the upper hand and things settled, that source of income was drying up. And in 1868, as the country opened, ports like Kobe and Osaka were becoming economic rivals. Glover had extended himself with speculative business deals and he had a lot of debt. But Prince Heisen 
the feudal overlord in that area had burdened himself with debt as well, partly by buying steamships from Glover. There was an opportunity for a symbiotic relationship. Takashima is a small island of about seven miles off the coast of Nagasaki. It had coal deposits, in fact, it had been worked but in a primitive way, but Western technology could be used to sink a deep shaft for large-scale modern mining. This made Glover's mouth water, and it would provide coal to boil the water in Prince Heisen's steamships. Glover needed to turn a profit, Heisen needed Western know-how. The first British-Japanese mining venture was about to begin, but neither of them had capital. They needed to borrow from Jardin Matheson. The deal was that Glover and Heisen would share the costs and profits equally. Glover would provide the European engineers and technicians. Heisen would supply the mass labour, officials and policing. But Glover had to put up the $40,000 capital for Heisen's half of the outlay. And he had to lend Heisen $43,750 to sweeten the agreement. So in fact, Glover was $150,000 deeper in the hole. Heisen was putting in no actual cash, but was pocketing 40 k in his hip up. All his costs were to come out of his side of the profits that Glover now had to produce in the seven year term of the contract. Mm -hmm. Glover's focus wasn't entirely on the job as he juggled other affairs and spun several plates to keep afloat. And some of the organisation was bleh, haphazard, like my speech. The rush to produce earnings to pay down the debt meant that the first coal shaft was sunk in a bit of a hurry. But the first coal was brought out in January 1870. Money started to flow, but Glover was still in financial straits. He tried a public share offer of $370,000 of stock, but he couldn't get interest in Tokyo. He tried to sell to the Meiji government, but no. He was like a juggler who'd been keeping too many financial balls in the air as it became more and more difficult to control. Jard Matheson saw the trouble and decided to call in their debts. All the balls were about to fall. And then, at the last minute, he managed to persuade the Netherlands Trading Society in Osaka to take on the debt that Jard and Matheson were laden. Oh, 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 oh. They were now the only safety net should Glover fall from the tightrope that he was walking. Walking tightropes, spinning plates, juggling. This guy was a one-man walking circus. But in the spring of 1870, a debtor called in $35,000 that Glover owed for making and supplying a gunboat. In August 1870, Glover went into liquidation. His debts stood at $564,000, his credits at $220,000, plus his share in the Takashima mine. The Dutch were going to operate that to recover their debts. Bizarrely, the fact that he was no longer juggling commitments meant that he could now give the time and attention that he hadn't before. He was now an employee of the Netherlands Trading Society and his own estate in bankruptcy. At the same wage that he would have earned as a clerk newly arrived from Scotland. In September 1872, with things stabilising, the Magi government sent folk to negotiate the purchase of the mine. Your dancer! The end of the tunnel was coming. But no. They opted not to. Damn it! Then, three months later, Heisen, along with a bunch of the other feudal princes, surrendered his estates to the government. Was that a light that Glover could see in the distance? No. He and the Netherlands society now had to deal with the government. But the government had taken on a bunch of British civil servants to act on their behalf, and you know what those gits are like. They were harder to deal with than the Japanese had been. 
challenging accepted rights, questioning undertakings given, dotting I's, crossing T's. Then, in January 1874, the Japanese government bought the mine from Netherlands Trading Society. Hurrah! By September 1872, most of Glover's debt was cleared. By 1877, he was out of bankruptcy. The government had no intention of operating the mine themselves, but as was their policy to privatise it by sale to a Japanese national. Goto Shijuro was a middle-ranking samurai who'd played a big part in the Meiji Restoration and once he'd saved two high-level British officials by chopping off the head of an assailant. Whilst he'd been in the first provisional Meiji government in 1868, he'd kind of fallen out of favour, and passing the mine over to him was a kind of sweetener to keep him quiet. But the story's not about him, so let's just say he soon lost interest and went back to Tokyo, and the mine was run by Jardin Matheson. Occasional interference from the long distance Goto. Now that's Takashima Island behind me. Over the years, the mine was a microcosm of the industrialization story. Industrial disputes, demands for higher wages, cash flow crises, leaving wages unpaid, riots, employees' destruction of equipment heavy-handed policing causing death to mine workers, armed miners causing British engineers to barricade themselves in with rifles, killing some and wounding others. A rebellion against the Tokyo regime, meaning miners were diverted to become fighters. A cholera outbreak leading to a total of 163 dead and Japan's first industrial accident. The road wasn't smooth. Now, I hate to skip over the detail, but there's only so much time. In 1881, the mine was taken over by Japan's first powerhouse industrial company, Mitsubishi Shipping, and they needed it for coal for its steamships just as Heisen had. And they were essential to Japan's growth and industrialization. Buying this coal island was the first diversification from shipping. Some of the coal would supply Mitsubishi ships and the rest would be sold in the Shanghai and Nagasaki markets. And who did they bring as commercial sales manager? Thomas Blake Glover. He was back in the game. In truth, he'd been back in the game since 1876. Employed by Mitsubishi reportedly on a higher salary than the chairman. The rebels that he'd backed much earlier in life were now high flyers in the Meiji government, and he lived in style. But this is the place that we've come to see. Now you might know it from the James Bond film Skyfall. You might know it as Hashima. You may know it as Battleship Island. Coal was first discovered in the island around 1810. Mitsubishi bought this place in 1890, building on their mining operation on Takashima Island and extracting coal from undersea. Land's been reclaimed, sea walls have been built. Four main mine shafts, some reaching down a kilometre, with one connecting to that other island. It's all built on the legacy of what Thomas Blake Glover started. Most of what's here was accommodation for the mine workers who lived in this, the most densely populated part of the planet at one time. The coal's dug out now and the island's now abandoned. It's a tourist attraction, a film location and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But it's also the site of forced labour. From the 30, 1930s to the end of World War II, Koreans and Chinese prisoners of war were forced to work here in the mines. When you come here, you see human achievement and human suffering, engineering success and barbarity, the heart of Japan's near miraculous industrial transformation and their heartless treatment of others. Now I'm not pointing the finger at Japanese specifically, they seem wonderful people. They're just part of the wider family that carries the human disease with the competing virus and antibodies of hope and hate, generosity and greed, cooperation and corruption. 
Japanese, Scots and any other nationality you came, care to name. The Bond film that came here revealed some of the complexities of his inner character and maybe that's appropriate. It's easy to look at characters and places in our history as either good or bad, selfish or altruistic, a force for good or evil. The truth is, they're seldom one thing and often they're both. I made a video about the wider background of Thomas Glover filmed in the northeast of Scotland and it's coming up on screen now. If you want to support the channel then become a Patreon member. Click at the top or you can buy me a coffee in the description below. I mean, dog is going to be a llama life. Cheerio and drastic.